This is Twit. Last Tuesday, Google's Project Zero published a six-part series which tapes, takes a very deep analytical look at a discovery the group made a year ago. That is during the first quarter of last year. Um, last week, I was talking about watering hole attacks where a browser vulnerability, in this case, it was that SCTP protocol vulnerability, where unlike a JavaScript vulnerability, which is occurring locally using code in your browser, in this case, in this, in this SCTP protocol, in order to be exploited, the user would have needed to visit, um, often being lured to, a so-called watering hole server. So I especially appreciated the way Google framed this campaign of theirs. Um, here's how they began the first of these six pages in this subst very substantial posting. They said, at Project Zero, we often refer to our goal simply as make zero day hard. This is not the first time we've talked about this. I think it's exactly the right goal. They said, members of the team approach this challenge mainly through the lens of offensive security research, as opposed to just like responding to how do they prevent. They said, and while we experiment a lot with new targets and methodologies in order to remain at the forefront of the field, it is important that the team doesn't stray too far from the current state of the art. One of our efforts in this regard is the tracking of publicly known cases of zero day vulnerabilities. In other words, they're like, they look at like really look at each of them and asks a, bu a bunch of questions about them. They said, we use this information to guide the research. Unfortunately, public zero day reports rarely include captured exploits, which could provide invaluable insight into exploitation techniques and design decisions made by real world attackers. They said, in addition, we believe that there is a gap in the security community's ability to detect zero day exploits. Therefore, Project Zero has recently launched our own initiative aimed at researching new ways to detect zero day exploits in the wild. Through partnering with Google Threat Analysis Group, TAG, one of the first results of this initiative was the discovery of a watering hole attack in the first quarter of 2020 performed by a highly sophisticated actor. They said, we discovered two exploit servers delivering different exploit chains via watering hole attacks. One server targeted Windows users, the other targeted Android. Both the Windows and the Android servers used Chrome exploits for the initial remote code execution. The exploits for Chrome and Windows included zero days. For Android, the exploit chains use publicly known N-Day exploits. And of course, referred to as N-Day because as I've often noted, they're only true zero days if they are not previously known. So if it's a publicly known thing, then by definition, it's an N-Day. Then they said, based on the actor's sophistication, we think it's likely that they had access to Android zero days, but we did not discover any in our analysis. So I have a, a, a picture in the show notes of the, the chart that they, that they provided along with this analysis where they show on the left incoming a number of affected websites, one, two, dot, dot, dot to N and that those websites deliver a pair of iframes, which are, which have no contact or affiliation with each other, other than that they, they are sourced from the same set of servers. And then one iframe will 
pull content from the Windows exploit server, because remember, an, an iframe itself is a reference to some third-party server that it pulls content from to fill the frame. The other iframe pulled its content from the Android exploit server. So both of them would do that, and and presumably they they only pull content based on the platform they find themselves running in. So if the if the Windows content pulling iframe sees that it's running on a Chrome browser on Windows, then it pulls the content. And the, but whereas the Android iframe would just lay leave itself inert and pull nothing. Whereas if it's if it finds that it's running Chrome on Android, then the the Windows iframe would not bother pulling iframe exploits into its frame, whereas the Android iframe would. So from that point, then they go in the the Windows exploit iframe performs some Chrome renderer exploits, um, and the Android exploit, if it's on Android performs one of a number of Chrome renderer exploits. You know, those being the, the problems that, that Google discovered being exploited by this particular attack. So, and of course, one of the things you note is that since the multiple servers apparently are serving this content, you know, this could well have been a malvertising campaign since, as we know, uh, ads run in iframes on their hosting pages. Um, anyway, so they continue uh, their explanation saying, from the exploit servers, we have extracted. So so the beauty of this is that they, they discovered this campaign while it was underway, which is what differentiates it from the typical zero days they learn about from, from third parties, they found this one, which allowed them to, to extract a great deal of knowledge about the attackers because it was still alive. So they said, from the exploit servers, we have extracted renderer exploits for four bugs in Chrome, one of which was still a zero day at the time of the discovery, meaning that they, they found something they didn't know about, a bug they didn't know Chrome had when, when they saw this thing working. They also found two sandbox escape exploits abusing three zero-day vulnerabilities in Windows and a privilege escalation kit composed of publicly known end-day exploits for older versions of Android. And of course, we know, unfortunately, older versions of Android are really much a large population of Android. So even though they're publicly known, they're still very likely to be active. They said the four zero days discovered in these chains have been fixed by the appropriate vendors. They said, we understand this attacker to be operating a complex targeting infrastructure, though it didn't seem to be used every time. In some cases, the attackers used an initial renderer exploit to develop detailed fingerprints of the users from inside the sandbox. In these cases, the attacker took a slower approach, sending back dozens of parameters from the end user's device before deciding whether or not to continue with further exploitation and use a sandbox escape. In other cases, the attacker would choose to fully exploit a system straight away or not attempt any exploit at all. In the time, they said, we had available before the servers were taken down, we were unable to determine what parameters determined the fast or slow exploitation paths. The Project Zero team, they said, came together and spent many months analyzing in detail each part of the collected chains. What did we learn? These exploit chains are designed for efficiency and flexibility through their modularity. They are well-engineered, complex code with a variety of novel exploitation methods 
mature logging, sophisticated and calculated post-exploitation techniques, and high volumes of anti-analysis and targeting checks. So they, so these exploits were themselves v- operating very defensively. They said, we believe that teams of experts have designed and developed these exploit chains. We hope this blog post series provides others with an in-depth look at exploitation from a real-world, mature, and presumably well-resourced actor. The remaining posts in this series share the technical details of different portions of the exploit chain, largely focused on what our team found most interesting. They said, we include detailed analysis of the vulnerabilities being exploited and each of the different exploit techniques, a deep look into the bug class of one of the Chrome exploits and an in-depth teardown of the Android post-exploitation code. They said, in addition, we are posting root cause analysis for each of the four zero days discovered as a part of these exploit chains. Exploitation aside, the modularity of payloads, interchangeable exploitation chains, logging, targeting, and maturity of this actor's operation set these apart. We hope that by sharing this information publicly, we are continuing to close the knowledge gap between private exploitation, what well-resourced exploitation teams are doing in the real world, and what is publicly known. And, and again, this is, this is chilling a bit like the whole solar wind revelations were. You know, the, the idea that, that there is this kind of high-level, sophisticated, methodical, careful, and clearly, in many cases, very targeted use of, of, of currently unknown vulnerabilities, you know, sort of should be sobering for us because, because the idea is that, that these actors know who they want, whose systems they want to get into, whose Android phones they want to penetrate, whose Windows systems they want to penetrate. They, they around, they arrange to get them to visit a server somehow hosting some content, which then puts these iframe payloads onto their browser window. We know that the chances are very high that certain an Android user will be using Chrome, a Windows user will be using Chrome, and they found ways to to break through, you know, the these renderer exploits are, are in as in page rendering exploits. So they have rendering flaws that let them escape from Chrome's deliberate containment, and then they go about doing what they want to do. For anyone who's interested in following up, I do have a link to uh, this Google Project Zero uh, blog page, which is the first of this uh, multi-page presentation for anyone who's interested. But what I thought to be the single most important phrase in what I read was where the Project Zero guys wrote, quote, in addition, we are posting root cause analysis for each of the four zero days discovered as part of these exploit chains. The key words there were root cause analysis. You know, in other words, oh crap, we just found another zero day. All, yeah, always definitely better to have found it than not, but much better for it never to have existed in the first place. So rather than just fixing it and saying who and then going to lunch, let's instead order in and spend lunch time asking ourselves how this fault was introduced in the first place and what takeaway lessons we can learn to preemptively prevent anything like this from happening again. That is essentially what they're doing. 
they are they are looking at every one of these zero days carefully, the code that surrounds it. Um, you know, how did it happen? Um, and, and I think this is exactly what needs to be done. Um, and, and clearly, the continuing prevalence of software bugs, which beleaguer our industry, suggests that examining root causes occurs far too infrequently. I, I've commented here on the podcast in the past that, that I truly love solving problems and puzzles with code. For me, it, it's a passion and a craft. So whenever I find a bug in my own code, as I've said before, I come to a dead stop and I spend some time asking myself and exploring how that bug happened in the first place. What was I thinking? Uh, exactly what did I get wrong? Is it likely to have happened elsewhere? Do I have a bad habit that needs correcting? In other words, rather than being embarrassed about a bug, be informed by it. You know, some, some incorrect way of thinking caused it. Um, and so I would submit that the only way for any craftsman to improve at their craft is to rather carefully examine and understand their mistakes. Certainly, Leo, we know this is the case with chess, right? The reason all of the, the really high-end masters record every move of their game is they're going to take a look at that later and spend a lot of time examining the board at, at each stage and, 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 and understand why they lost the game. You bet. Uh, yeah. If, in fact, they did. It's, it's, you know, at, at a certain point, it's the only way. You're just not going to get better by hoping to do better next time. At some point, you know, you, you really have to understand the nature of the mistakes you're making in, in order not to make them again. And there have been instances where I have found a bug where I realized, oh, my God, there are others of these. And I've like I've you know <laughs> designed <laughs> you know designed a, a a a regular expression a regex which will find the other places uh, where I almost certainly did the same cool. thing wrong yeah. and you know and and fixed other ones. So it's hard for pr it's, people because we we're blind to our own mistakes often. That's it's so yes. hard to do your own debugging. Because you stare and you stare and you stare at the code and you go, looks great, it looks great. I don't <laughs> understand. I can't, you know. But it, I agree with you. It, it, there is a certain sport to it as well. It's kind of fun. Oh, it is. And when and when you when you are stepping through the code and the debugger like shows you like, okay, I'm moving this into EAX, and it's like, wait a minute. Uh, I just wiped out what was there, right. which I'm going to be needing in two steps later. It's it like, must be oh! so easy to do that in assembly code because, you know, any modern high-level language has all sorts of protections yeah. so that you avoid that kind of thing. But it's all on you, an assembler. Well, it, it is. But what I like about it is nothing is hidden. There are right. no, like... This I meant for this to be unsigned, and it's like now you know blah blah blah. It's like no, there's no such thing right. in, in assembler. 